one of the most important romantic poets of the uh, uh, of, in Europe of the time was Giacomo Leopardi from Italy. He was a, in many ways, very much like Keats. Uh, he died relatively young after a long uh, illness. He was never particularly healthy. Uh, he had some mysterious condition that uh, made him a hunchback and and made uh, and was pain and it was life somewhat unendurable. So he lived an extra like 13, 14 years than, uh, than Keats did, but they could not have been particularly fun years. Uh, and the poetry kind of bears that out. But the uh, primarily what he's good at, that Keats was good at too, but that Leopardi really makes his, uh, his particular contribution is the, this notion of uh, a blessed ideal uh, that is eternally visible and uh, eternally inaccessible. And that that torture of seeing that is almost the only thing that keeps him going. Uh, he writes poems to his pain, if you will. Uh, <clears throat> We can see this most, uh, perhaps most explicitly, in uh, one of his more important lyrics, "The Infinite." Um, this lonely hill has always been so dear to me, and dear the hedge which hides away the reaches of the sky. So here's an image of it. Uh, the poet goes and he sits on a hill and he looks off in the distance, and yet he sees uh, dear to me the hedge which hides away the reaches of the sky. The reaches of the sky can be the infinite. The hedge is just nature and reality that obscures it, that gets in the way, uh, but it is still dear to him. It is still somehow quite precious that that interrupts his uh, experience of infinity. Oh. But sitting here and wondering, I fashion in my mind the endless spaces far beyond, the more than human silences and deepest peace, so that the heart is on its edge of fear, and when I hear the wind come blowing through the trees, I pit its voice against the boundless signless and summon up eternity and the dead seasons and the present one, alive with all its sound. And thus it is, in this immensity my thought is drowned and sweet to me the foundering in this sea. Um, it's uh, death as a consummation, uh, again, kind of like Keats, uh, very much, this is very much uh, like uh, Ode to a Nightingale. Um, the uh, man is subsumed at the end into uh, kind of these twin poles of nature and the infinity. Uh, he, mankind, Leopardi himself, uh, is essentially swallowed by this immensity uh, that he seems to be wishing for. Uh, my thought is drowned and sweet to me, the foundering in this sea. It, it's a, it's it is a wishing for death of sorts. It is a wishing for, uh, it's more than death. It's a wishing for uh, a, a, a dissolving into some notion of the infinite, some notion of the ideal, a place where there is no pain. Um, the, uh, the romantic uh, sensibility of um, uh, conjuring the ideal and seeking to join it is foundational in this poem. Uh, relatively late in his life, uh, he wrote the, uh, the poem to himself. This is only three years before he died. Uh, <clears throat> a se stesso in the original Italian. 
and it is uh, it, it's another lament. He this is his mode. I mean, Giacomo Leopardi is not the guy you turn to for a couple of giggles on a Saturday night. Uh, now you may rest forever, my tired heart. The last illusion is dead that I believed eternal dead. I can so clearly see not only hope is gone, but the desire to be deceived as well. Rest, rest forever. You have beaten long enough. Nothing is worth your smallest motion, nor the earth your size. This life is bitterness and vacuum, nothing else. The world is mud. From now on, calm yourself. Despair for the last time. The only gift fate gave our kind was death. Henceforth, keep scorn upon yourself, nature, the ugly force that hidden orders, hidden orders universal ruin and the boundless emptiness of everything. Um, perhaps a little bit more nihilistic uh, than, uh, than the average English romantic poet, let's say. Um, it is a uh, a scorning of um, uh, of of life. Quite honestly, um, he is wishing his his heart to stop. Uh, now you may rest forever, my tired heart. Quare the uh, core the. Um, There is this symbolic uh, interpretation that you can go at here. Uh, he, as a lifelong invalid, he never had a particularly well-developed um, romantic life. Uh, so maybe he is, after a disappointment, uh, I believe there are notes that this was written after a particular love affair or infatuation let's say, on his part, uh, had finally been uh, dispelled. Um, maybe speaking of his romantic capacity with his heart and saying just as, a, uh, as somebody who has loved and lost, okay, we don't want to hear from this anymore. We're, uh, that's enough for that. Um, but there is that other interpretation of it being physical, of wishing for your heart, the muscle in your chest that propels the blood through your veins, to stop. That is a plain reading of the text. The, uh, the opportunity for that is open to any interpreter. The, um, what, what the poem does nicely, I think, what it balances nicely, is this matching between those two poles of the symbolic and emotional and idealistic notion of the heart and the physical, material reality of it. Uh, it doesn't really divorce the two. Um, it identifies nature as an ugly force. Um, but still, it's calling on nature to stop the physical pain. Um, nature gave him this pain. Nature can take it away. Uh, nature is an ugly force that hidden orders universal ruin and the boundless emptiness of everything. But he's clearly wishing for the boundless emptiness of everything. He's clearly wishing to dissolve upon a midnight and feel no pain. Uh, this is a, a very nuanced and complicated interpretation of the role of nature and whether it is a good or evil force. Um, this is a uh, this is a curious positioning for a uh, for a romantic poet. Um, <laughs> One of his more famous ones, uh, famous poems, is uh, is to Sylvia, where the um, uh, which is another infatuation uh, that has come to nothing. 
uh, you, you paint a very tender story of uh, uh, of this is apparently somebody who uh, perhaps worked as a maid in his home. Uh, he his family had some money, and so you know they had a, a full household staff and a large house. Um, so he develops little crushes, perhaps, and it's uh, he paints this little picture of a maid who works for him, uh, for whom he develops some feelings, and it leads nowhere. But significantly, he is recalling this. Um, she has apparently died. Uh, before the winter struck the summer grass, you died, my gentle girl, besieged by hidden illness and possessed. You never saw the flowering of your years. Um, the, uh, so he is remembering this girl as a, an older uh, man and he seems to be fixating on it. Now, whether or not this is uh, like the one true love, how major it was, I, I don't know. But again, you have this sense of a poet who from the recesses of the years are, is transporting himself back to recall something very sweet. Uh, and and calls on her, the, this girl who, who he has lost, to recall something as well. The first line is, Sylvia, Sylvia, do you remember still the moments of your mortal lifetime here? So he's talking to a dead girl and saying, you know, do you remember? Um, and memory is a, a, a key attribute of uh, romanticism through Wordsworth. You get the sense that, you know, it, he enjoys, the poet enjoys, and perhaps she does too, and he's questioning this, the process of remembering those sweet times, just when he could hear her voice through the halls or pass her and see her smile. Um, and, and you get this sense of the memory being both uh, a sweet sustenance that keeps him going, but also a pain that drags him down and yet he keeps going and scratching at that memory and you have to ask why without going again with all of these poets who die so young it's very easy to get lost in their biography and start speculating about uh, what was going through their minds on their deathbeds. It is an inescapable reality of the interpretation of their poem, but it can't limit it. Um, but it seems to me that he is, he's painting a picture of loss and a, a way that the loss, the feeling of that loss, is somehow at least a memory that he had something, however small that was, just a glance here and there, the sound of her voice, these simple, very elemental um, attributes, these very elemental moments, sparks in, in, in an endless, endless timeline of suffering they keep him going going they keep him um they keep him alive in a way in a way that very little else does he uh he has a very frustrated romantic life this is obvious uh just as a narrator uh, as a poet uh, as a poet rather than you know as a in, in the biography you can see and that frustration is something he does keep going back to and you get the sense that his his desire to live is bound up in his desire to experience both joy and pain and he understands in a very fundamental way that he can never be without the pain but Maybe he can just add the joy too. One of his 
one of his other interesting ones that he does uh, to a another uh, uh, female uh, is one to his lady, um, uh, where he he paints this another a doomed infatuation, but at the end he uh, he ends it in a very curious way. Um, whether you are the only one of the eternal ideal, ideas, eternal wisdom refuses to see arrayed in sensible form, to know the pains of mortal life and transitory spoils, or if in the supernal spheres another earth from, another, un, from among unnumbered worlds receives you, and a near star lovelier than the sun warms you, and you breathe benigner ether, from there, from here, where years are both ill-starred and brief, accept this hymn from your unnoticed lover. Which is a, it's a very curious lyric, uh, translated here by Jonathan Galassi, one of his more, uh, one of his really great translators. Um, but that notion of, uh, The ideal of the woman as a representative of the ideal, the woman as a prisoner of the ideal, woman as a uh, an incarnation of the ideal. Um, whether you were the only one of the eternal ideas or eternal wisdom, um, he wants to pray. He wants to sing this hymn from your unnoticed lover. Wherever she is, whatever she is, she's not a human being anymore. She is an ideal. She is a spirit. She is divinity in a certain way. Um, he wants to sing to her. He needs to sing to her. Accept this hymn. It's a prayer. And that is the only thing in all of this that's keeping him alive. 